Good evening. Today is Sunday, August 23rd, 2020, and we are reading Rye on the Rocks with the Rye Historical Society. Um, we are on chapter Rye if by land, by the forts if by sea, and uh, I am drinking rosé at this happy hour. So I hope that you are happy and finding some joy uh, amongst the thunderstorms this evening. As a result of its importance to colonial shipping, it was early during the War of 1812, brought about by the British attempt to regulate trade between the United States and the British enemy France, that Portsmouth, with its commerce and navy yard, should be threatened. British warships were known to be patrolling our all but defenseless coast and to have entered the lower Piscataqua Bay, but finding the upper river strongly fortified, they sailed away without incident. However, news of other coastal landings did reach the port city with the tales of horror generated in their passing, leaving the coastal inhabitants in a constant state of uneasiness. Although a direct attack up the Piscataqua was not expected, it was felt by many that the British would land at some nearby coastal point and march overland, thus attacking Portsmouth from the rear. It was for this reason that the residents of Rye became greatly alarmed concerning their exposed coastal location. As early as 1812, it was voted that the town selectmen deliver to each man as Colonel Goss should allow to have a good firearm, one half pound of powder, and a proportional amount of lead balls. Along with two cannon stationed at the meeting house and previous arrangements having been made to provide the town militia with suitable martial music, Rye hoped itself prepared for war. Although the first year of the war apparently did not directly affect Rye, at a town meeting in 1813, the town voted an additional purchase of 100 pounds of powder and a proportional amount of lead. As the town had no powder house at that time, and there was feeling against storing the ammunition in different homes, the rough under the eaves of the meeting house was decided upon as a safe place of storage. Early in April of 1814, the British Admiral declared the entire coast under a state of blockade and subsequently destroyed much of the shipping in Massachusetts Bay. On April 5th, there was much excitement on the New Hampshire coast with the reported sighting of the British warships Juan and Tenedos off the coast of Salem, Massachusetts. However, immediate apprehension subsided when the British ships were soon lost from view of those on shore. The farmers might have been resting easier, but military le leaders were not so easily pacified, and a long petition was presented by the residents of Portsmouth requesting Governor Gilman for more troops to protect the port city. The effect of this petition was no doubt aided by a similar note from Commodore Hull, also believing an em enemy attack imminent. Excuse me. As a result, on May 20th, the governor issued orders for nine new companies to be sent to Portsmouth. Of these new troops, a portion were assigned to the forts, a portion to the South Rope Walk, and a third portion to the Portsmouth Plains to meet any force which might attempt to storm Portsmouth via Rye or Hampton. What with all the preparatory action for battle, excitement was at a very high peak, when on May 29th, two British warships anchored off the coast of Rye at a point known for years after as Gunboat Shoal. Probably the action was no more than the British putting their decree of coastal blockade into token effect, but to the residents of Rye, it appeared that the British were about to launch a massive attack on their peaceful town. People began immediately to move from their homes near the shore to points further inland, and a state of general alarm was very much in evidence. At Rye Beach, Mr. and Mrs. Whitehouse, Jonathan Brown, so named for having the first painted house in town, felt that their children would be safer with relatives of Mrs. Brown at Breakfast Hill. So packing them and her best feather bed into a chaise, she hurriedly started off. It was dark when she left home, and as she drove with all possible speed through the woods on Grove Road, she heard the sounds of a rapidly approaching horse and soon could distinguish the outlines of a vehicle. In attempting to pass each other in the narrow road, the wheels of the two carriages interlocked so that both drivers were obliged to stop and back up in order to free them. Only after Mrs. Brown was well on her way again did she realize that no greeting had been exchanged. In fact, in fact, so tense were their nerves that no word had been spoken, and she never knew the identity of the other party in the collision. Although Rye Harbor of 1814 was certainly not a great shipping port, as most of the trade of that day was carried out by water, it was frequently a very busy one. Other than local fishing boats, vessels loaded with potatoes, Rye's chief export product, sailed regularly for Boston. It is recorded in an 1823 New Hampshire Gazetteer 
that in the fall of the year, farmers with their carts waiting to load their products on a carrier might be seen lining the roads far in the distance from the harbor. Evidently, the hysteria of impending invasion had not overtaken William Matthews or Robinson Foss, for on the morning of May 30th, they were fishing from a pung off Rye Harbor when they noticed a British barge pursuing a fishing schooner up the coast. Realizing that the fishing schooner was about to be overtaken, Matthews waved his hat to attract the schooner's attention to the nearness of Rye Harbor, and then noticing that the schooner had noted their warning, started with Foss for the ragged, ragged neck. Evidently, those in the barge crew were not happy with those who had aided the escape of their prey, for by the time Matthews and Foss reached the shore, it was to the accompaniment of British gunfire. By this time, the chase had come to the attention of the militia posted on shore, and as the British pursued the schooner into the harbor, the militia was ready and waiting. On an alert since the previous night, Colonel Goss had stationed half of his men behind a stone wall on Ragged Neck, and the remainder behind another wall at the opposite side of the harbor on Little Neck. How they found a vantage point which afforded much protection is not known, but it was reported that many spectators from Portsmouth and surrounding towns were also on hand at Ragged Neck. As the barge entered the harbor, it was hailed by a resident of Little Neck named Mo. This was answered by a volley from the barge, and not to be insulted on their homeland, the Battle of Rye Harbor was underway. At this time, Colonel Goss decided that one of the cannons should be brought from the meeting house and sent his son William with William Barrel to the center for that purpose. The cannon and ammunition were soon gathered from their storage space in the attic of the meeting house, and the return trip to the harbor began. However, going down over Meeting House Hill, the bottom fell out of the ammunition box, resulting in the cannonballs rolling down the hill in many different directions. Oh, goodness. After collection of the ammunition and once more heading toward the scene of the battle, the journey was once more interrupted when the horse bolted, going up Mr. Aaron Rand's hill. This delay caused the cannon to arrive at the harbor too late to be of service, as the British had by this time sailed away in retreat. The battle was, if short, apparently very intense while it lasted. Although there were no casualties on the shore side, the coxswain of the barge was seen to fall and thought to have been killed. The end of battle showed many of the militia to have used their entire allotment of ammunition. Perhaps the battle came in at a very opportune time for many, as there had been no logical explanation why the ammunition which they had held in their position for possession for over two years had been used for military purposes. A fine of five dollars would have been in order. Evidently, there was some criticism as to so much powder being used with so little to show for it. However, the enemy had been driven off, with one saying that the shooting out into the harbor he took as careful aim as he would have been a duck. Suspecting a full-scale invasion, a company from Portsmouth under the command of Captain Joshua Pierce started for Rye but was turned back on the way by a messenger with the word that the enemy had been driven off. Included in this group of militia was the later to become famous Senate leader, Daniel Webster. Indeed, the British ship had hauled anchor and sailed away as soon as the barge crew was aboard. With the departure of the warship, the fishing, fishing schooner was able to make its way that night under cover of darkness into Portsmouth Harbor. Although highly pleased with themselves for twisting the lion's tail in such fashion, the fear of enemy invasion remained high among the inhabitants of Rye. On the night of June 21st, a panic occurred in Portsmouth when an alarm was sounded that the British were landing forces at Rye to attack Portsmouth. This report, however, proved to be only rumor occasioned by the fact of a transient fishing boat being sighted off of our coast. At a town meeting on July 18th, acting upon an article to see what method shall be taken for the defense of the seabird of this town, it was voted to choose a committee of safety of five. Two of this committee were named General Goss, Captain William Seavey, Colonel Amos Parsons, Peter Jenis Esquire, and Captain William Trefethen. It was the formal responsibility of this committee to act as a liaison between the people of Rye and Governor Gilman in the affairs of coastal defense. Again, on September 7th, Rye returned to a war footing and a high degree of anxiety as a result of notice being given by the governor for the entire state militia to be ready to march at a moment's notice to defend Portsmouth and the seacoast. However, here once again, the period of anxiety passed without incident. Although actual combat was carried on elsewhere for another six months, the differences between Great Britain and the United States were concluded in December of 1814 by the Treaty of Ghent, the Battle of Rye Harbor being New Hampshire's only contact with the lion and the unicorn. So today's video will be a short one. Uh, we are just uh, about 10 minutes. Uh, we aim for, for 20. Um, 
I wonder if I should start salt pork, pork and sardines. I can start salt pork and sardines. We may get through much, enough of it. Next chapter, salt pork and sardines. As a result of their small resemblance to the supermarkets and shopping centers of today, it is rather difficult to identify Rye's first store. Although the goods of the first settlers were drawn from a common storehouse, it was but a short while before the settlers each went his own way, each man being generally responsible for the welfare of himself and his own family. The settlers had experienced shops and inns in Europe, and it is quite obvious that as soon as the settlement had reached a basic level of development and its separation from other towns became more complete, the buildings for the purpose of commerce would be a logical conclusion. Rye's first sophisticated commerce apparently centered around the local inns, the first being operated by Benjamin Skagel. It was in 1702, only 10 years after the Bracket Massacre, that by order of Her Majesty the Queen Anne, Skagel was granted property at the present intersection of Sagamore and Wallace Sands Roads. He is said to have operated a tavern here from 1702 until 1755, when he sold his property to Ebenezer Wallace. Another early Rye Inn was built at Rye Center in 1747 by Robinson Terferen, who came to Rye from Newcastle. After operating this inn until 1756, he sold the business to Simon, Peter, and Benjamin Garland for 2,426 pounds. The Garlands, in turn, managed the place jointly for three years, after which selling out to Benjamin, who operated the place alone for about 40 years. Although this Garland Inn is still standing as a private residence at Rye Center, the Schedule Inn was destroyed by fire in 1798. That these Rye innkeepers were responsible for the sale of other than lodgings and spirits is supported by Alan Johnson, who, writing of early 18th century fairs in his Chronicles of America series, he states the following. Although fairs were held in all of the colonies outside New England as a result of the strict church laws, they were seldom held in the northern colonies. Whereas fairs were completely outlawed in Connecticut, in the other states they were usually ordained by law, although sometimes purely private undertakings, as that held in Rye, New Hampshire, which was promoted by an innkeeper. These fairs, which were usually two or three day events, were held chiefly to bring people together, to encourage trade, and to provide a general commerce or traffic among people that want to buy or sell either the products or manufacture of the country or other sorts of goods and merchandise. As well as the horses, oxen, cows, sheep, and hogs offered for sale, these fairs also had a high social aspect, which included such events as trying to catch a goose or a greased pig at full speed and the inevitable whittling and whistling contests. One of Rye's first stores, as we know them today, was operated by Joseph Parsons, son of Joseph Parsons, a captain in the Revolutionary War. Stories indicate that the business involved great risks at this time as a result of the general depreciation of currency at the end of the Revolutionary War. In an attempt to halt further inflation, the merchants of Portsmouth and the surrounding towns sought to fix the price of a certain commodities and not raise them for a month. However, in spite of their efforts, the state of currency grew worse each month. In January 1780, Corn was $15 per bushel, and seven months later, $50 for the same amount. Beef at the same time was $5 per pound. The soldiers returning from the war after being paid in currency were, of course, among the worst off financially. Joseph Parsons is reportedly to have seen a man come into a store and light his pipe with a $5 bill. Another early ancestor of our present-day stores was created when John Carroll, with his brother-in-law Simon Goss, built a two-story house with an L at the corner of Washington and Lang Roads, wherein they opened a store for the sale of small wares. This store also included an inn and a tavern for, in 1796, Carroll, a sometimes school teacher, was recommended as a suitable person to retail wines and distilled spirits, and in 1798 became a licensed innkeeper. However, even after changing locations to a larger place of business at the top of Breakfast Hill, also called Center Hill, even the cocktail license was not sufficient to keep Carroll in Rye, and in the early 1800s, he sold his share of the business and moved to Northampton, where he once more entered into the business of being a store tavern keeper. Although business did not warrant Carroll's continuance in Rye, it was far from the end for Rye stores. In 1819, the Carroll and Goss store was occupied by Amos Seavey and Jonathan Drake, who continued as merchants. In the following spring, another bar was born when Amos Parsons was appointed to keep a tavern and retail all kinds of spirits as the Lodge Rex. Apparently, the new taverns in such a small town caused the drinking situation to get out of hand, 
1824 and 1821, a town meeting was held to seek an end to the vice then ruling in the town of Rye. At this meeting, dealing with the specific offenses of profane swearing, intemperance, gambling, and profanation of the Sabbath, particular emphasis was stressed that tavern owners and storekeepers use their endeavors to prevent any persons from drinking to drunkenness in their homes or stores, and that no minor or servant be trusted at all with any ardent spirits without leave of their parents. It was decided at this time that the taverns be shut up at nine o'clock in the winter and 10 o'clock in the summer, except on such occasions as town events shall warrant their being open longer, and then not to an unreasonable hour. It was also decided to take specific action to see that the Sabbath laws be kept and that no drinking or idly spent time be allowed except during intermission. Evidently, the good old days were far from reverently peaceful, and it could very well be looked upon as divine intervention when, on February 18, 1824, Amos Parsons' store was destroyed by fire. However, a recession was not to follow, as in 1824, Thomas J. Parsons, the preacher's son, was allowed to retail liquor with the stipulation that he sell not less than one pint per man. Evidently, this business was quite profitable. As in 1831, the house and tavern on Center Hill, originally built by John Carroll, was purchased by Mr. Parsons and remodeled into the fine square colonial house, still standing at the side of Rye Center Hill. And I'm going to remind you that this book was self-published in 1962. So it was self-standing in 1962. During the next few years, the local stores continued to prosper. In 1837, about the time that Major Thomas Rand purchased the original Carroll and Goss store, meal was selling one for $1.20 per bushel, and pork was bringing 16 and two-thirds cents per pound. This last store is of particular interest in that it remained in the same family and retained its original design until the death of Blake Rand in 1949. In 1952, the building was sold out of the Rand family and converted to a modern home. A particular feature of this store was its upstairs social hall. Although now serving as an extra large bedroom, it still retains its slightly domed ceiling. Had a person been in possession of an appropriate engraved invitation, he would have been admitted to this hall to enjoy a gay Christmas cotillion held on the eve of the Civil War. Not in direct competition with the year-round stores, but of equal importance to the economy of Rye were the stores at and near the beaches, which catered to the sweet tooth whims of the summer tourists. Um, I'm going to show you at this point the pictures, photographs actually, in the book. So here we've got Rand's store at Rye Center. And then on the other page, we've got Spears Confectionery at Central and South Roads. And Locke's Soda Fountain, where Fanny held forth. Often only a converted front parlor in the home of a local farmer, these seaside stores generally operated under the title of salons. The Oyster and Ice Cream Salon of Mr. G. H. Jenis is a typical example. Operating in 1866, a quarter mile north of the Atlantic House, this business offered ice cream, cool soda, and a well-stocked assortment of pies and cakes. A special feature of the salon was a bowling alley, which advertised as a place where men and women can exercise their muscles and thus live a long, happy, and virtuous life. Not to be outdone in collecting the spoils of the season were a Mr. Biggins, who also operated a Rye Beach salon, and Emmons B. Philbrick, who advertised in 1867 that aside from his ministerial duties, he also operated an ice cream salon and eating house. Prized in the last century, as well as this, was the store which boasted the local post office. After conducting both operations from his front parlor, Charlie Spear, the local bandmaster, erected a store at the corner of South Road and Central Road. If newspaper reports are reliable, Mr. Spear would probably have been glad for a few less city folk who expected their mail first. As well as being the local office of the American Express Company, this building also housed a branch of Preston's big Portsmouth drugstore. Also operating in conjunction with a second attraction was the store run by Mrs. R.J. Locke at the Bathing Pavilion. Few came to Rye Beach without becoming acquainted with Fanny Jones, custodian of Locke's soda fountain. Operating another Rye Beach salon was Archie Jenis. Although robbed during the era of Jesse James, it is quite likely that he was not the brains of this crime, which netted its instigator $30. A number of cigars and four boxes of sardines. Although not advertised in such a grand manner, stores were also scattered along the other Rye Beaches. 
Adams Drake had a store and a casino in conjunction with his livery business located just north of the Ocean Wave Hotel, and Alba Foss had a small store at the shore end of Washington Road in the same building which housed his photographic rooms. Here's the Adams Drake Casino and Livery Stable at North Rye Beach. No doubt, not alone as a failure in the art of shopkeeping, the tale of a Washington Sandy Beach Road farmer is among the most humorous. Although the father of six children, this seems to have been his greatest success, as his labors with the soil were generally as unrewarding as his shopkeeping. Perhaps someone should have warned him against the venture, as some of his former business deals had been none too profitable. Known as a man who would cut wood all day for a pitcher of cider, with his generally sickening results, his neighbors thought that perhaps things were taking a turn for the better when he made a deal to sell a barrel of apples to a Portsmouth doctor. However, after picking his able apples, paying 50 cents for a barrel, and $1 for the use of a wagon to haul them to Portsmouth, he couldn't be convinced that $1.50 didn't include a neat profit. Lazy and illiterate, although sometimes evidently using his mental deficiencies to generate sympathy for his lack of learning, he was not blind to the summer tourist who used to pass away the summer evenings by walking up Washington Road to view the natives. Borrowing $10 from Long John Martin, he bought $5 worth of cigars, $5 worth of candy, and decided that he was in business. However, not being so slow as to fail to heed the value of advertising, he had Tom Burrell paint him a sign. Not necessarily appropriate. The sign went a great way toward putting Sandy Beach advertising on a par with that of Rye Beach as it hung over the farmer's doorway proclaiming, Wild Irish goods and molasses. However, even this stretch of the imagination did not bring the purchasing public flocking to his door. The story goes that he smoked the cigars, his kids ate the candy, and he used the sign to patch a hole in his roof thus bringing to a close the short career of the John Wanamaker of Washington Road. We'll end there tonight. Next week, the air will cure all will be up. We hope to see you then. Good night.